having won this race, I have realized one of my life's ambitions. I said before I came here that it would be the last race I'd run, because I want to play football. And now I'm not so certain I may run next year. Congratulations, Doctor. I knew you'd bring the bacon back to Ireland. Oh, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did because I see it. It was a terrible fight when it lasted. I'm glad I did. We have it anyhow. And uh, I hope by Berlin that the Irish race with a five or six instead of a couple. Upon this field unfolds the tale of battles that were fought by two Irishmen who gave the world a golden They came to Los Angeles to visit their past. Old friends together in an Olympic arena for the first time in 52 years. Dr. Pat O'Callaghan at 78 had journeyed from his home in Ireland. Bob Tisdall, a year younger, had traveled from Queensland, Australia. They met, they talked, and they celebrated those distant days of 32 when sport was an innocent pleasure and young men could achieve a kind of immortality in the space of a single hour. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Los Angeles and the 10th Olympic Games. Ever since they built their Coliseum in 1923, Los Angeles had wanted to stage an Olympics. And not just any Olympics, these games quite simply had to be the best the world had ever seen. For this city dealt only in superlatives. Despite the glitter of Los Angeles, world events conspired against its Olympics. It seemed sheer madness to stage such a festival in the depths of economic depression. But the city never lost its confidence. The games would go on and the world would be invited. The organizing committee of the Olympic Games of 1932 has the honor to invite you to take part in the competitions and celebrations, which will take place on this occasion at Los Angeles. Somehow, nobody expected this man to answer that invitation. Robert Morton Newborough Tisdall had an athletics talent which was almost untapped. In years to come, the Los Angeles Times would describe him as polite, educated, cultured, and above all, a sportsman. An Englishman could imagine no finer accolade. But Tisdall, despite his bearing and accent, could not think of himself as an Englishman. He was born in Ceylon, an outpost of empire, to Irish parents who enjoyed a colonial lifestyle. His father, a tea planter, had been an Irish sprint champion in the 1880s. His mother, following the custom of the day, saw little of her son and entrusted his upbringing to an ayah or governess. I think my first memory was, was uh, playing with a cobra, I think vividly, and my old ayah came along and gave me hell in Singalese, which I could speak before I could speak English, really. She killed the snake with a stone and, um, well, I owed my life to her, I think he was just about to strike me. I think that's about the first memory I've got. Inevitably, he was sent to an English public school, to Shrewsbury, where he met the housemaster, Freddie Pryor, who, along with his father and uncle, would have a critical influence on his life. After Shrewsbury, Cambridge was almost a natural progression. The young man was developing a sense of style, which the university relished. He was also developing that enviable sporting talent. 
Well, that was actually the main reason why they sent me, because they knew I had this terrific athletic ability, which is when I left Shrewsbury, I'd won, I won seven events in the sport, you see, so I was a natural. And they said it was a pity to waste the talent. And I think these, these old three got together, you know, and said, here's a, here's, a, here's a racehorse, let's put him in. Don't let him escape from the track, you see, and I think that's one of the motives. By it. Certainly Freddie Pryor said, don't let him waste that talent. This is Mr. R.M.N. Tisdall, Cambridge, who's just won the 120 yards hurdles in time of 15 and 4 fifths seconds. Tisdall became something of a legend in university athletics. In the 1931 match with Oxford, he won the long jump, the high hurdles, quarter mile and shot. But the Cambridge days were over all too soon, and even a golden youth needed to find work. Tisdall typically succeeded in a most unlikely quarter. I got a job... Um Eventually, um, with the, uh, the Maharaja of Baroda. I met his lady-in-waiting to his Maharani, as a matter of fact, a woman called Mrs. Starr. And she said, well, the old man's looking for a young uh, English <laughs> um, ADC, and uh, made an interview. So I went along to the Dorchester Hotel, just been built in those days, and uh, up to his suite and uh, met the old chap. And he said, come over to... Uh, to Wiesbaden in Germany with me for three weeks and we'd see how we get on, you see, and, and we absolutely clicked. Yeah, I was taken for walks, you see, that sort of thing, and I, I used to read him to sleep. I read him the Bengal Lancer. Above, above. <laughs> you wouldn't believe it, reading an Indian Maharaja. He loved it. He's very, very British. Though the work was lucrative, Tisdall grew restless. He met some friends who reminded him that the Olympic Games were only three months away. It set him thinking. Nobody needed to remind this man that the Olympics were approaching. Pat O'Callaghan had won the hammer at the Amsterdam Games of 1928. His strength had been developed by hard physical work on the family farm in Derry Gallon County Cork. And from an early age, his size and his manner had commanded respect, just like his father before him. He was involved at some period of his youth in some of these old faction fights. Some of the last faction fights we had in Ireland. Uh, certainly the last in Cork County. There was some in Tipperary after that. Uh, down in, the, in my area where I'm living now, in Clanmel. They were about the last in Ireland. But he was involved in trying to pacify people principally. And they had to, I suppose, forcibly separate them and this kind of thing. And, he was reasonably well known in the whole area in that, in that connection. It was his father who introduced him to the thrill of ferocious competition when the men of Munster gathered for their annual sports meeting at Bantia. I remember he, he lifting me up, I must have been about four, I should think. He lifting me up over the crowd to look down on the various people and telling me this one is that and that. Be the finals, you know, they would come up to the line and put you up and show you that what is happening. And, I remember that clearly. Young Pat was captivated by the excitement of it all. He threw himself into athletics, not just the trials of strength, but into disciplines which came less easily to him, like the sprints and the high jump. But that massive frame was primarily designed for the heavy events. I was always big. I was 16 stone at 16 years of age. And I was, I was maybe as tall as I am now, you know, I was over six feet. It certainly didn't grow much after that. I, I might have grown an inch or two. His intellectual development kept pace with his strength. He went up to Dublin and became the youngest doctor ever to qualify from the College of Surgeons. But he had become fascinated by the hammer. He was 19 when he found a heavy cannonball in the derelict castle of McCroom. He persuaded a blacksmith to attach a wire clothesline and a metal handle and then he proceeded to teach himself the art of hammer throwing. I remember I used to be throwing that hammer in the winter time and I'd be in holidays from the college in Dublin and I'd be maybe three or four or five weeks at home at Christmas time and I'd be throwing this hammer and you know the ground would be very wet and I had strong heavy nail boots in me and 
just to follow me around the place and I'd fall and I'd throw backwards and I'd go down and I'd be crying. But however, well, I suppose I strengthened a lot in doing it. I don't put it that way. Eventually I evolved a technique. His reward came with astonishing speed. At the 1928 Olympics in Amsterdam, his strength overcame the limitations of his technique, and with just three inches to spare, Pat O'Callaghan gave Ireland her first Olympic gold medal. There was to be enormous pressure on him to repeat that performance in Los Angeles. Tisdall knew no such pressure. For him, the games were still a distant dream. But he decided to find out about the selection process. His friends expected that a background of Shrewsbury, Cambridge, and the English establishment would lead him in the obvious direction. These friends of mine thought I would probably run for, for England, you see, but when it came down to it, I said, no, I can't do that. Although I'm qualified, I'm primarily an Irishman, you see, and that's my country. I wrote to General O'Duffy, who was in charge of the Irish Olympics, and I put a suggestion to him, telling him that I was already in training, you see, <laughs> such as it was. <laughs> I got a letter back saying, stick to it, and come over on such and such a day and, and give it a go and see if you can reach the Olympic standard. I chose the event. I'd never competed in it before, you see, but I was a good hurdler and I was a good quarter miler. And put the two together, I thought, well, here's, here's, a, here's a go. And I rented a, an old railway carriage, sort of a cottage thing down in, a, in, a, in an orchard in Sussex. And I started my training there. I had 10 weeks to try and get my lotus legs into action life and, uh, and that, that's how it all began but at the olympic trials in dublin he was not impressive while o'callaghan qualified with the ease of a gold medal prospect tisdall failed even to register the required 55 seconds but the irish kept faith with their recruit they liked the man and they liked his style so along with o'callaghan tripper jumper eamon fitzgerald and steeplechaser michael murphy they sent him for special training in Ballybunion. Ballybunion's a grand spot to be down in Kerry. Out on the coast, the air is like wine or like water. The golf course is better than most. On the beaches and cliffs you can race, chase the waves down by the sea. For training there's no greater place, so run wild or run easy and free. There's good will and there's friendship and fun who needs fame, recognition and wealth. It's enough to be fit, to be young, to have sport and the gift of good health. Training facilities were so sparse that Tisdall had to build himself hurdles from driftwood. But there were good times to be had, particularly when the group was joined by Tisdall's coach from Cambridge, Alec Nelson. Well, it's a story actually. <laughs> Pat, did you put the wind up in? He said, uh, <laughs> he said, look, Alec, this is one of the, or was recently, one of the most dangerous parts of Ireland. There's a lot of shooting down here. And uh, so I took, uh, I took uh, Alec along for a walk on the golf course, you see. And I was telling him about this. And then uh, we sat down out of the wind in a, in, a, in a bunker there, you see. And I was telling him about this, that it was, it used to be. He was, he was deliberately... And, uh, deliberately conditioning him for what is to follow. Yes, right? yes, it was, it was very funny, you see. He's so not a major mover in himself. We sat down, I thought we were fairly safe in this bunker, you see, and then we heard a couple of shots, and I said, good Lord. And then whoosh, a bullet went right over the top, it clipped the sand above our heads. I said, my God, that was a new one, Pat. She was, you see, it was a big, big show, he put it up, you see. <laughs> Alec went down in the bunker like this, and I, he said, this is serious. I said, yes, it is. Didn't mean it to be. <laughs> and, uh, we crawled out over the side down onto the beach and ran like hell, you see. <laughs> and, uh, you could almost hear Pat laughing up in the golf course. <laughs> well, as I remember, I was inside the hotel before yeah. you came in. Oh, uh, waving his 303 rifle in the air. The benefits of Bally Bunyan at once revealed themselves. The little team were in fine form at the Irish Championships in Dublin. And now, at last, they were ready for the Olympics. So they put on their best suits and prepared to cross the world. The sea journey to Boston took a week. It was a pleasant, leisurely voyage and the Irishman's spirits were high for they had equipped themselves for any emergency. 
Uh, we brought everything that was kind of necessary. Of desirable. <laughs> I know something that even. You ever ever drink patine? Yes, I think I had a bottle of patine. Yes. Oh, yes, I, I had. Remember. I remember having that. And you remember at the customs, uh, the bottle happened to hit the hammer and make it a clink, and, and America was dry in those days. Oh, I did well. <laughs> and uh, there was everybody's ears were twitching. I tell you, it was a very funny moment. It was a very funny <laughs> moment for you, probably, but I, <laughs> I, was hold, I was holding the baby at that time. <laughs> we introduced him as a doctor and said it was medicinal, so, but I, uh, so we got a laugh out of the Irish customs officer and we got through with it all right. <laughs> They needed all their high spirits on the arduous train journey across America. Those benefits of Bally Bunyan were put to an exhausting test as they clattered through mountains, deserts and cities in the course of a long week's trek. But they were sustained by the thought of their destination out on the west coast, where teams of workmen had constructed a village amid the scrublands of the Baldwin Hills high above Los Angeles. It was the first Olympic village, the first experiment in communal living for Olympic athletes, and it was ready to receive its guests. They descended upon Los Angeles from all over the world, 1,400 athletes from 37 nations, facing a welcome which was warm and genuine. The Olympians were fated and fussed over, and up in those Baldwin Hills, at least one sportsman was quite overcome. I went to bed to start with, because I, uh, to recover from the journey. Oh, I mean, you know, I spent about up to 16 hours in bed every day. Reading, just to that, that was what I started to do. I didn't do very much training in the village until I began to feel like it. There was a couple of, I got a couple of hurdles, didn't there, somewhere... You had a couple of hurdles up, up. On the grass there, yeah, I used up. to jump over those. I was my own trainer and I knew what my body wanted, and that was rest after that trip, you see, so I took a chance and did that. The village quickly became a haven of cheerful anarchy, with inquisitive crowds queuing for a glimpse of those talented strangers who were enjoying the finest facilities at a cost of two dollars a day. Los Angeles had set out to build a temporary home from home, and the athletes were quick to tell them how well they'd succeeded. The dining rooms were very good. The food was a terrific variety of food there, and you had to watch that, of course. <laughs> At least he didn't have to worry. He, he, he used to have eight raw eggs and a glass of milk before he started on his porridge. <laughs> or was it ten? <laughs> it varied according to the quality, what I could get of them. You know, <laughs> something yeah. around a dozen when I could, but I'd eight or ten of them. Well fed and thoroughly well suited to the easy-going atmosphere of village life, the Irish team was ready for anything the Olympics might offer. The opening day saw Callaghan pull on his green blazer and prepare to lead his country into the arena, while Tisdall, with his first race the following day, stayed to relax in the village. But moments before the opening, Ireland's athletes discovered that they were to march under the banner of the Irish Free State. They objected strongly, and another board was quickly prepared, which bore the single word, Ireland. All was well, and the Irish contingent, now joined by the boxers, took its place. The opening ceremony was a triumph of pageantry but President Herbert Hoover refused to interrupt his re-election campaign to attend. He had badly misjudged the mood of his country, for in a world rapidly becoming more confusing and sinister, the 32 Olympics were America's declaration of faith, its rebuke to recession. In his place, Hoover sent Vice President Charles Curtis to open the Games. Los Angeles deserved something better than an understudy. Twenty-four hours later, 
Competition began and the high jumpers immediately set a soaring standard. The event was close and intense, but after a jump off, the Olympic title went to Duncan McNaughton of Canada. In the shot putt, nobody could measure up to the American Leo Sexton, and after winning a comfortable victory, he was subjected to a brand new and less comfortable ordeal by the newsreel cameras. This is Leo Sexton of the United States, who set a new Olympic record of 52 feet 6 inches today. Well, folks, sure was a great kick to be able to go out there in the field today and be able to keep that shot put championship in the United States. Thank you. The day's last field event provided the first glimpse of Babe Didrikson, who was to become one of the dominant figures of the Los Angeles Olympics. She gave the Games their first world record with success in the javelin. It was an intriguing taste of things to come. But amid all these champions, a novice was preparing for Olympic competition. Bob Tisdall of Ireland was among the runners for the heats of the 400 meters hurdles. It was only his third race over the distance and ironically, there was a spectacular fall outside him. But the novice kept his feet. Entering the straight, he was spare and he won the heat in 54.8 seconds. It went very well from, from my point of view. I got to the, I didn't have really any troubles. I had to focus on every hurdle and be very careful. And uh, when I found that I'd, I'd, I'd arrived too soon, the next, the next hurdle I, I reached out a bit, a bit more. I was learning on the way around, literally. Two hours later, the semi-finals, and Tisdall in the outside lane demonstrated how much he had learned. He jogged home utterly untroubled and equaled the Olympic record of 52.8 seconds. The outsider had become a contender. I was very surprised. Very surprised. More than surprised, I was delighted. <laughs> Naturally. Tisdall was now 24 hours from an Olympic final. O'Callaghan had travelled this road before, but he also faced his final next day. They had a long night ahead of them. I went to bed, if, uh, not early, I wouldn't think so, I would have went to bed normally. And I know that I had to, I was waking a couple of times towards morning by somebody walking around the room with the, with the, cover, with the, with the cover over his shoulders. It wasn't me, was it? I don't know, I, I'm not <laughs> mentioning an end, but it happened to me. Somebody walked up, disturbed the peace of the room at that time of the morning. I remember Pat got up and he said, oh, I got a pain in my back. And I said, good, not in the back like that, man. You're, you're some, it's the nerves. You ought to know that. And of course it was. Do you remember that? Pat? I do, yes. I oh, he said, I'm finished. My back's gone. Nothing wrong with that back. I had to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I can well, the, do the doctor gave me advice. <laughs> yes. Yes, I gave the doctor advice on that one. The stadium stands deserted, glowing in the setting sun. Monday, August the 1st, the first track and field final of the day, the men's 100 metres. The Americans Eddie Tolan and Ralph Metcalf run stride for stride. The newsreel camera favours Metcalf. But for the first time in Olympic history, the result is decided by a photo finish. Tolan, controversially, is declared the winner. But all three medalists accept the verdict when they come to take their bows. Introducing the three fastest humans in the world. Winners of first, second and third in the 100 meters dash. Eddie Tolan, first. 
Ralph Metcalf second, both of the United States. Janet of Germany third. Ireland's day had now begun at the Hammer Circle, and it had started disastrously for Pat O'Callaghan. Instead of the soft throwing circle he expected, he had discovered a surface that was as hard as concrete. He'd brought three pairs of shoes, all of them spiked or studded, and all of them useless on that unyielding surface. For the sake of a decent foothold, an Olympic title was slipping away. I knew the minute I went on it and took the throw that I was, that I was in trouble. But I, I put on the, the shortest spikes I had of the three. I had, I had a pair, I had, I had a longer pair, of probably an inch spike. The ones I was wearing were about two thirds of an inch, I'd imagine. And I had a longer spike then, and also I had a pair of football boots with football, light football corks in them. First throw went all right, but I had to adapt for what I was afraid the surface was, that I, would, that I, that I couldn't operate on it too very fast. So I, I, I took a very fast two-turn throw to see what I do and to what, try and qualify with it. For six would qualify. A desperate situation demanded desperate measures. After that first throw, Dr. Pat left the field and headed for the stadium tool room. He had 15 minutes before his next throw and he had to work quickly. The spikes had to go. So I got a file and a hacksaw blade and I tried to cut with that. And I couldn't because the spikes were very, were very hard, they were case-hardened spikes. And then I got the file, and the file would, did enter into them, but very slowly. So I, was, I got a bit panicky then, but I said, how, 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 how long will it take me to cut these off? So I sawed away all the time I could in between throws as fast as I could, and I got some of them off, and one after the other, until I was down to two, about two, three left. As the saw did its work and the spikes grew shorter, so O'Callaghan's throwing improved. But when, after four throws, the hammer event was halted for the 400 meters hurdles, Finland's Ville Polhola was holding a clear lead. The doctor would need all his strength, all his nerve. Meanwhile, Bob Tisdall was unaware of the drama at the hammer circle, for the hurdlers were gathering for their final. When you're queuing up to take part in a thing like that, you're Yo, yo, <laughs> very busy. That, uh, down in that tunnel there, that's a terrifying place. You, that's where you collect before you're called out to get on your marks. And that's where you have the real wind up, just before the start. And we were all doing the same. We were moving around like this, you know. Great. Actually, I began to realize there that uh, what these early Christians must have felt like in the Roman stadium before they went to Colosseum, before they went out to face the lions. <laughs> it was all... It was bad, yes, but very good for you, because uh, the adrenaline runs like hell, and you can't, without that running, you can't do your best. Fittingly, the race had brought together the very best in the world. Tisdall had to face his varsity rival, Lord David Burley, the 1928 champion, and Morgan Taylor of America, the 1924 winner. How were they reacting to the atmosphere of the tunnel? Oh, they were all moving around, feeling much as I did. You must realize that the... Uh, your competitors are the same feelings. And it was David Burley and I did most of our chatting together. We didn't talk to the others. And um, oh, he helped me a lot. He, he calmed me down quite a lot. Very nice of him. 3.30 on the afternoon of August the 1st, the final of the 400 meters hurdles. Lane four, Tisdall. Five, Taylor. Six, Burley. Seven, Glen Harden of America, the most powerful contenders taking the outside lanes. Unbelievably, the Irishman had run away from the field. Tisdall first, then Hardin, Taylor, and Burley. Having won this race, I realized one of my life's ambitions. 
I said before I came here that it would be the last race I'd run because I want to play football. And now I'm not so certain I may run next year. I had a feeling I was in front and right halfway around the bend there was this great pole with loud speakers on top of it and it bellowed out enormous noise. Tisdall's leading, you see. Well, I heard that and uh, it upset me as a matter of fact. Anyhow, it, I, I recovered from that and I got round. There was the last hurdle and I said, well, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to jump it into it was a four-foot hurdle. I've got to get over this one, but I missed it. I hit it with my left calf and I, it, it lifted me, you see. Fortunately, my rear leg didn't hit it. My eyes water in a, in a wind and they were watering then. I couldn't quite focus it. Under the rules of the time, the fallen hurdle denied Tisdall a world record of 51.7 seconds. But not even his Corinthian modesty could disguise the scope of his achievement. And Ireland's day was far from over. I think it was Pat O'Callaghan came across and, and shook my hand and smacked my bottom and that brought me down to earth. Well, bring you down too, smack from Pat. <laughs> so, uh, and then I asked him how he was going on in the hammer. And he said, I'm in a bit of strife here, as a matter of fact. Can you give me a hand? Yes, I said, what's wrong? He said, well, I, I've got two throws to go and I can't get the revolutions going because my spikes are too long. And uh, I'm trying to uh, file them down. I wonder, could you come and give me a hand? Well, that was just sort of a relief that I needed, you see. Something to do, you know. And I was thrilled. We went over and we sat down over there somewhere, filing his spikes down. While the whole <laughs> stadium <laughs> watched. I think we were holding up the, the, the Olympic Games. I think he got one spike off at least. <laughs> I had about three to go, two and a half, I'd say one was fairly well cut through. So he came over and he had one done while I was doing the other, finishing the other two off. His fifth throw was better, but he was still second, just three inches behind Porhola. He had one more throw, one more chance to retain his Olympic title. Oh, there was a sudden shout in the silence from some... Uh, uh, a bellow, I'd call it. Give it to him, Pat. So that was, I had to stop. I actually, I, I was actually swinging the hammer on that when I had, I had the first swing around my, my shoulder with the, with the hammer. And I had to put the hammer down to settle down again. See, these, they are these things you, you adapt, you, have, you cultivate a, a way of uh, controlling the butterflies within you, they describe them. And uh, to get settled, you know, I had a special method of my own, and I had to put the hammer back and start to conjure that again to calm myself down. I started to swing and it took three turns, and well, I knew I got a good throw. One hundred and seventy six feet eleven and one eighth inches. It wasn't just a good throw, it was a gold medal throw. Congratulations, Doctor. I knew you'd bring the bacon back to Ireland. I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did because I see that to the terrible fight where it lasted. I'm glad I did we have it anyhow. And I hope by Berlin that the Irish face with a five or six instead of a couple. O'Callaghan's success had followed within an hour of Tisdall's, and as Ireland's anthem sounded, they stood on the victory rostrum and wrestled with proud, unfamiliar emotions. It's one of the most emotional uh, experiences I've ever had, standing on that. Now you sort of bring it up. Boy, that is It's true. the biggest moment, actually, of, of my life. I mean, it's the highest sort of pinnacle I've stood on. <laughs> and it's, uh, it sinks in. It sinks in. I think if you stood there very much longer, you'd probably start feeling tearful. Yes, yes. The sentiment, yes. for one reason or another. It's a, it's a difficult thing to, to, to describe, I suppose, because, but I felt you, you might cry, you might not, you don't, we don't do that kind of thing generally, and, but you might do that kind of thing. A lot of people do, a lot of people won't, don't, but you, you feel full up inside you of some kind of a, an emotional thing that's akin to going to cry. Run faster than a hare Pat O'Callaghan's great hammer Speeds like lightning through the air 
the banners raised, the winners praised. All the world stands amazed at two who share a golden eye. Back home, they could scarcely believe it. Ecstatic headlines brought the news from California, and then a nation which understands the art of celebration got down to serious work. A committee was formed, funds were raised, and a memorable welcome was planned. But the games of Los Angeles were throwing up other triumphs, other heroes. Tommy Hampson maintained Britain's tradition of 800 meter success by judging his effort to perfection for a new world and Olympic record. I can't help saying how pleased I am that I've done it. More than I expected to do, to do the two things, win the event and break the record too. But naturally, I'm very proud that I can take the title back to England again. Another Briton, Tommy Green, celebrated the first staging of an Olympic 50-kilometer walk with an overwhelming victory, leading home the field with more than seven minutes to spare. for all with the Finns favored to win the long stiff struggle. But a young Italian named Bacali from Rome surprised the world. There he is, third. Now watch it. He's uncorking that sensational sprint and he's second. He's first leading the way to the tape and another world's record. A great track victory for Italy. The first three men in the 1500 meter final. Bacali of Italy, Corns of Great Britain second, and Edwards of Canada third. Babe Didrikson, second from the right, came out for her second gold medal, snapping over the 80 meters hurdles in 11.7 seconds, yet another world record. And then the first major track controversy, in the final of the 5,000 meters. Larry Leitman of Finland and Ralph Hill of the United States sprint for the finishing line. The American in white is far stronger, but Leitman obstructs him in the home straight. The crowd is outraged but there are no complaints from Ralph Hill. In the spirit of the 32 games, he accepts defeat and exchanges mementos with the new champion. But while the 5,000 meters row was still bubbling, a familiar figure was back in action, rather unexpectedly. Well, I got a bit of a shock because I just had a couple of days on the Tuesday and Wednesday. I was relaxing naturally after a thing like that. And then, then they sent for me and said, look, somebody's dropped out of the decathlon. We're putting you in for it. Well, that, that meant the last two days, flat out from dawn to dusk. And it <laughs> shook me a bit. I, I wasn't try, expecting that. There were three events I never even competed in. <laughs> but I said, well, let's get back into the stadium and see what I can do. And that, that's, what, that's, that's how I ended that week. The 400 meter final. Climax of the season's thrilling speed duel between Little Bill Carr of Penn and Big Ben Eastman of California, the American entry. Look at him go. Nobody's loping in this race. They're hitting a record-breaking stride. And there on the inside is Big Ben Eastman leading them all into the final stretch. With little Bill Carr speaking alongside for all his work. They're fighting it out now. Carr's in the lead to win by two strides, sweeping the track for America. If the 400 meters was clear-cut and decisive, the steeplechase was a genuine fiasco. The lap markers were distracted during the race and the lap boards were not adjusted, so the entire field ran an extra 450 meters. Iso Holo of Finland was the worthy winner, but with that extra lap, his time of 10 minutes 33.4 seconds will stand as the slowest in Olympic history. But the world records continued to tumble. New standards were set in each of the women's events and the sprint relay, the last women's race of the program, saw the Americans and the Canadians produce one of the most dramatic finishes of the games. The United States team that won the 400 meter Olympic championship, Miss Carew, Miss Perch, Miss Rogers, and Miss Von Bremen. And so the classic distance, the marathon. 29 men set out to run for 26 miles through the streets of Los Angeles, a Los Angeles which now lives only in old men's memories.
Juan Carlos Zabala of Argentina had led the runners from the stadium. Now he brought them back. Two hours, 31 minutes and 36 seconds later, the winner and new Olympic champion. While public attention turned to the boxing hall and swimming stadium, Tisdall and O'Callaghan could at last sample the delights of Southern California. And out of the blue, Tisdall was invited to the most glittering social event of the Games, a party given by Douglas Fairbanks and Mary Pickford at Pickfair. It was a rather sudden last minute invitation, as a matter of fact, because I didn't know this party was on. But I suddenly got an invitation to, to go to it, and uh, I didn't know what sort of a party it was. So I got into my best suit and um, an ordinary lounge suit and a friend lent me a car and uh, I started off to find this place. So I got a bit lost. So I said, this looks a good place, I'll have an inquiry in here. And I went in and I knocked at this door, huge big oaken door, I think, with brass studs in it and an enormous uh, black butler came to the door dressed like a Argentinian field marshal, you know. And he looked and he said, no, sir, he said, Mr. Charles Chaplin lives here. And I said, well, I'm up amongst the stars anyhow. I said, and he showed me where to, uh, this, this place, I said, how to find it. And I arrived up there and received very graciously indeed, and I was introduced to um, Mary Pickford. She looked about 18, actually from a distance, until you got really close, you could see she was a little bit older. It was quite incredible, really. And um, then I discovered that it was a full dress affair, you see, everybody wearing decorations. I mean, it was a, it was a big thing. After all, uh, it was the, the party social highlight, I think, of the game. Because this place, well, I suppose it represents the Buckingham Palace of Hollywood, really. And um, they were the sort of uncrowned king and queen of that. Yeah. At dinner, Tisdall sat and chatted with the aviator Amelia Earhart. And after the meal, the dashing Fairbanks provided his guests with an exclusive preview of his latest film, Mr. Robinson Crusoe. Such a party. It actually made the morning papers. I think I know why I was invited at the last minute. Because I was told that Douglas Fairbanks, you see, I'd met him before in the Olympic Village. He and Will Rogers were wandering around the village. I think they were looking for tips that were on, they were on the bet, and they came to see Pat and I in our little hut, and we had a lovely conversation with them. And after the dinner, uh, somebody whispered in, whispered in my ear, <laughs> you know, Douglas won a thousand, thousand dollars on your race. <laughs> and I have a feeling that might have been the reason for the invitation, the last minute invitation. It was, it was lovely, it really was. Neither could the film capital ignore O'Callaghan. Hollywood was in the market for a young Hercules, and Louis B. Mayer summoned the Irishman to the studios of MGM. They showed me around the, the studio, and they were making pictures there. I met whoever was there. I remember John Barrymore was there, and I was in his dressing room. He was making up. They were making a film, and then we went into the actual studio where there was a number of people being they shout and cut and cut and up and down and put on that light and this light. I was like it'd be in a barrack square or something there like it, you know. But however, that was a, I was there for a time, at, uh, for an hour or so. He was thinking of casting me after Johnny Wiesmiller at the time. He was finished. He had done the first stars and not the first big stars in any way. And he wanted me to know that I'd be interested in seeing what, I, what was in me to do that type of thing. He considered the Tarzan offer. Then he turned it down. Beverly Hills could not compete with rural Ireland in the affections of the man from County Cork. No, 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 definitely no. I st and even still, when I come back here today, I mean, and yesterday and that kind of thing, it, I'm not a bit shy. Uh, it, it confirms my narrow-minded outlook, possibly, from many points of view, but however, it's mine. It confirms me that I, I don't like it. And then it was over. To the strains of the Hawaiian farewell, aloha, Count Bayer Latour, the president of the International Olympic Committee, brought the Games of Los Angeles to a close. Aux autorités de la ville de Los Angeles, 
le tribut de notre profonde gratitude. Et, selon la tradition, nous convions la jeunesse de tous les pays à s'assembler dans quatre ans à Berlin pour y célébrer avec nous les Jeux de la 11e Olympiade. Tremendous lot of people all the way in, and there was a tremendous crowd at Dawson Street, where the mansion house is. Tremendous crowd waiting there. It was quite fantastic. I remember all the way that six miles was lined with the, with the army and the police force in PT kit, in, in, in white vests and shorts and trousers. All the way, it was amazing. At the Mansion House, they were greeted by Dublin's Lord Mayor. Then off to the Gresham Hotel for what was virtually a state dinner in the presence of Ireland's Prime Minister, Eamon de Valera. The meal was memorable, the menu even more so. Grapefruit Tisdall, Noisette d'Agneau à la Ballybunion, Pudding Souffle O'Callaghan. Dawn was breaking over Dublin when the last toasts were drunk. Eventually, they went their separate ways, and Tisdall was taken in triumph to Nina, his home in Tipperary. There was a turnout in every village. Welcome, and all this, and the band turned out, played sometimes two bands playing different tunes. It was terrific, <laughs> extraordinary. It, it, the news had spread all the way down a hundred miles to Nina that we were coming, you see, and um, I never, I never experienced anything like it. Dr. Pat returned to Camp Turk, and there was never a chance of his slipping in unnoticed. at every crossroad that we were passing and the tremendous crowd in the town. Big platform, there's a square in the town there, quarter of an acre. That was full of people and platform in the middle of it, and everybody spouting and speeching, spouting. <laughs> oh, what's it going to do? It was all good, they were. Uh, after that, we had a dinner in a local restaurant. Called, they, called, they named it at that time the Olympic Restaurant, because they're still... And, um, we had a very pleasant meal and evening there. And the Guinness again at last. Yeah. <laughs> a glass of the black stuff was the least they deserved. The celebrations drifted from days to weeks, but at last the euphoria subsided and their deeds passed into song and story. More than half a century has gone by since two young men strolled through this stadium with their lives stretching before them. Tisdall was to leave Ireland to travel and farm in southern Africa before settling with his wife and children in Australia, fiercely refusing to grow old. O'Callaghan also moved from Cork to Tipperary, where he built a fine practice and raised a large family close by the town of Clonmel. They were never allowed another Olympics. Sport surrendered its innocence, and politics denied Ireland her place at the Games of Berlin. But the regrets quickly passed, for down the years lingered the memory of that afternoon in 1932 when a flag flew and a band played and the music soared out across the city of the angels. In Los Angeles. 
it to 